Don't talk now. Isn't it? Is it the one with the film? Oh, what are you doing, Sean? You're late. You're late. Just one more. Oh, you're ten. You're ten. Come on, please. Come on, come on. 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 Gate crash are coming through. Sorry to spoil the party. At least I hope I haven't spoiled the party because I come bearing gifts. A little book which says Creator of Coronation Street, Tony Warren. This is. find that out tonight because there are a few stories to be told. We're doing it here, but before we do it, can I have one from my album as well? Yes, certainly. You hold the book. I'll stand here. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> And thanks very much to everyone, including your friend Tim Justice, for helping with our surprise, especially the now world famous stars of the street you created. <laughs> Well, they do look well. Tony, tell me, what is your memory of watching that very first episode? Ah, uh, being sick in the loo. Uh, as far as I remember, yes. Uh, opposite Pat Phoenix's dressing room, running in terror and being sick in the loo. We'll try and control it now because we're going to take a look. The time is 7 p.m., the date, the 9th of December, 1960. <laughs> Altogether. That's foot mile. I'll give you a bit of signal another time. I'm afraid you won't. What's well, so, up? Don't you trust me or something? That's got nothing to do with it whatsoever. It's the rule of the house. Rule of the house. Yeah. Well, it's government's money, really, isn't it? See ya. Whatever did you want to do that for? You don't want to go wasting your sympathy on him. It's Elsie I'm sorry for. Ooh, some mothers do have them. Now, apart from you, there is one other person well qualified to recall that very first episode, and that is, of course, William Roach. <laughs> You were one of 20 characters in that first episode. Yeah, yeah, absolutely terrifying. Tony's quite right. It was live television, which was very frightening. But really, what I'd like to say is when we got those first scripts and we read about these wonderful, strong characters, like Ina, Elsie, Minnie, Martha, these Dickensian and all... Zibsonian type characters, and then the wonderful rich dialogue. I thought, I can't wait to meet the writer. He's got to be some wonderful old 
world-weary sage <laughs> who's sort of been there, seen it, and done it all. And we get to the rehearsal, and in walks what I can only describe as this ridiculously young boy. And you're not changed, Tony, <laughs> really. You're still in there, still in there. But it, it isn't... I had a 30-inch waist when this show began. I uh, know, well... <laughs> You're allowed to put on a little, I think. But it wasn't just that. It wasn't just the great talent. It was your own personal energy, enthusiasm and optimism that you injected into the veins of the street. And it's still running there today. And on behalf of us all, thank you, because without you, we might all have a proper job. You know, who knows? But uh, thank you, Tony, and, and well done. Thank you. Well said. Thank you. Well Well, Tony Warren, this is your life, and you were born here in Manchester on July the 8th, 1936. Home was number three, Wilton Avenue, Swinton. Not exactly Coronation Street, nor was your name, Anthony McVeigh Simpson. You were the only child of fruit importer George McVeigh Simpson. That's not him! <laughs> That's the father of the Mayor of Gloucester. <laughs> With somebody we met on holiday. I did know. Let me ask you one thing. Are you Tony Warren? <laughs> Different, didn't it? Yes. This may take some days, but we'll see. <laughs> After Grosvenor Road Primary School, you go to Eccles Grammar School, but you weren't a happy boy there, were you? No. Why? I was bullied. Bullied? Yes. Were you not a big boy then? I had a sharp tongue, but I wasn't very big. No. Well, in 1948, when you were only 11, there was a production of Twelfth Night at the Manchester Opera House. You waited at the stage door, autograph hunting, and you approach a young actress. Well, you won't want mine, because I'm not important. Formerly Albert Square's Doc Cotton, June Brown. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll stand and let you do it. Now, June, you did sign, and thereby, I hope, hangs a tale. Yes, a very strange one. You see, I was a very new young actress. It was my first week. And my friend, Margaret Chisholm, and I, we would decided to go out for tea. And at the stage door, there was this little girl and this little boy. And uh, the little boy said, please, may I have your autograph? And we said, oh, you won't want ours, because we're not important. And he said but you might be one day. Oh, yes, that's what we thought. We thought, isn't he sweet? So we took them both out to tea, didn't we? We did, yeah. yeah. And then about two years ago, a journalist said to me, oh, June, can you give me a first, Henry Kingsley? And I said, a first. I thought, I'm not giving her my first lover, I thought. So I thought, well, what can I give her a first? performance that oh I said my first autograph so I told this story about this little boy and this little girl and I also said I'd love to know who they were well when this article was printed I got a telephone call and a voice said hello this is Tony Warren it was me <laughs> lovely story thank you June yes right. I was getting a bit you supposed to tell them the one about how it did oh <laughs> Well, Tony, someone else with fond memories of those days is, of course, your mother. She's not well enough to be here, but she sent along a surprise visitor, a favourite aunt from your childhood. You haven't seen her for 30 years. Your mother's sister, Rini. Rini! Really, take a seat. <laughs> oh. oh. You're going to sit down. You're going to sit down. Thank you, darling. Now, really, young Tony had a, a puppet show as well, didn't he? He did, yes. He used to go round old people's homes. He did all the patter and his um, cousin, Roy, made all the puppets. Mm. And the show always began like this. Yeah. Puppets on parade, I'll sing singing a song for you. Puppets on parade, never, never let, let you feel blue. blue. Wow, this is your cousin, Roy <laughs> Van Gogh. <laughs> 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 
Don't be standing in my way. Don't be standing there. Right? <laughs> right, there was a time when you and your cousin were going to a show on a bus. Yes, um, we were giving a show to Wesleyan Methodist Chapel, and do you remember... The Golden Arm? Yes, you devised, you devised this, this scene where the, the handkerchiefs were chased... The Ballymouchoir? Yes. <laughs> and, um, the handkerchiefs were chased by... A pair uh, of scissors, an arm with a pair of scissors, and you said you had, that the arm would look awful, so you gilded your arm from here to the elbow. Yes. And we were on the bus, yes. and a lady passenger turned to her friend and said, it's marvellous what they can do with artificial <laughs> limbs these days. <laughs> Thank you, Roy. <laughs> At the age of 12, you decided to further your ambition by dropping a gentle hint to BBC Children's Hour in Manchester. How'd you do that? Oh, well, really, I wrote to them and said, uh, your child actors aren't, aren't very good and I'm better. And uh, can I have an audition? And? I got one. And you were on the air? Very quickly, yeah. Yeah. Well, you became friends with another Children's Hour regular, a young performer who was to go far. In fact, she hardly ever comes back. Tonight, she's in the south of France, Judith Chalmers. Hello, Tony. Oh, BBC Manchester was where we first met in those radio plays on Children's Hour. What a breeding ground for talent that was, really. I mean, there were people like Billy Whitelaw and Robert Powell and all the aunts and uncles, Auntie Doris, Auntie Vi, <coughs> Vi Carson, and you brought her to millions of people through your idea of Coronation Street. And those terrible hairnets, weren't they awful? But, you know, on which you were here, we have a Coronation Street Club. It's my favourite programme, certainly. And wherever we are, in a desert, up a mountain, beside a lake, somebody will have the up-to-date story of just what's happening in the street. So thank you for all that. Congratulations on such a winner. And now, from beside the Mediterranean in the south of France, bye-bye, have a great night. Thank you, Julia. Oh, thank you, <laughs> Uh, you had a, a favourite song that Violet Carson used to sing to you, all about a Lancashire street. Oh. At number one in Bowden's yard, my granny keeps a school. Who hasn't many scholars yet, who's not but one or two. They say toad woman's well... Now, could that have planted the germ of an idea? Might have done. I, um, because, you see, it was number three, right face in pub. Uh, I don't know. I never know, but it's the nearest I ever think I know to where I might have got the idea from. Right, well, we'll catch up on it later. Your enterprise in getting yourself on to the BBC leads to stage school. You were 15, <laughs> but it wasn't a long engagement, was it? Uh, oh, no, I was expelled from stage school. Why? Was it? Rabble rousing. Rabble rousing. That's a good one. <laughs> well, you decide to run away to the bright lights of London, hitching a lift from a lorry driver, but you were soon back in Manchester as an assistant stage manager at Hume Hippodrome. You get modelling work, and you also manage to get acting jobs on radio and <laughs> early why TV. I <laughs> I've got one just like that myself. <laughs> You're on the midnight train from London one night when an idea for a series comes to you. The BBC producer on that train with you recalls it well, Olive Shapley. Hello, Michael, and hello, Tony. Oh, and it's Ollie. lovely to be part of your programme tonight. There's one occasion I'll never forget. Uh, it was the very beginning of television, and I took you to London to be in a small television play that I was producing. And when it was all over, we caught the midnight train back to Manchester. And somewhere around two o'clock in the morning, you woke me up and you said, Olive, I'm sorry to wake you up, but I've got to talk to you because I've had a wonderful idea for a television series. I can see a little back street in Salford with a pub at one end, and I do all the lives of the people in the street. And I looked at him and I said, Oh, Tony, how boring. I'm not to sleep again. Well, have a lovely evening. <laughs> But refusing to be discouraged, you sat down and you wrote a script entitled Our Street. You sent it to the BBC. And what happened? I sent it to the BBC and I got a letter back uh, from a man called Barney Cola, and who must be sick of hearing this story, although I don't know him. And uh, it was a very nice letter and he said he was going to show it to his planning uh, committee and he would let me have their reaction. 
and I'm still awaiting their reaction. <laughs> So it was back to writing applications for acting work. You get an interview with the casting director at the recently opened Granada Television, and you do get a job as a scriptwriter. At the age of 21, Granada give you your chance writing TV adaptations of the Biggle stories. And Coronation Street took off from an altitude of six feet. You perched on top of my filing cabinet. Well, tonight it's his turn to fly from his home in Canada, the street's first executive producer, yeah. Harry Elton. Where? <laughs> Get on your mark. <laughs> oh, Harry, uh, this might seem a silly question, but why was Tony Warren on top of your filing cabinet? <laughs> he uh, came into my office one day, leapt up on top of the filing cabinet, clasped one of my vases of prize chrysanthemums. chrysanthemums. Oh, how I hated those chrysanthemums. Yeah. <laughs> and he said, I'm not coming down until you let me write something I know about. Well, I couldn't leave him up there all night, so I said, Get out of here and come back in 24 hours with a script. And you did. Well, you, you actually said, how about the story of the street out there? And I said, I already did it and sent it to the BBC. And you said, well, go away and do it again. And when you brought it back, it was 95, 98% of that very first episode. Yeah. And uh, you called it Florizel Street. And the powers that be said, we can't call it Florizel Street because no one will remember it. So we winnowed it down to Coronation Street or Jubilee Street. And one night the Three Harrys went out and we consumed just about every bottle of Beaujolais in the new theater pub. We had a lot of things to think about, including that title. And we decided on Jubilee Street. <laughs> and three weeks later, when the TV Times came out, it said Coronation Street. None of us could remember who'd made the error. We were so drunk. <laughs> but it was a great idea. Harry, it was. Thank you very much. So, Coronation Street was born, but it wasn't an easy birth, was it, Tony? Harry will bear this out. They said, uh, they said he was a Canadian, so he would not realise that this was the, la the language of the music halls, the language of George Formby, um, that nobody would understand that the station would be a laughing stock. In fact, one director of the company said, if this goes out, the advertisers will withdraw their advertising. And since then, Tony, of course, countless millions of real people have shared the fictional lives of your creations. Give mind back to VJ Day, madam. Cast it back. Two yanks held the ladder up to the front of your house while you toddled up and hung out a banner that said, God bless Monty and the boys. Never in the memory of God have I known such downright sarcasm and no talk to me at all. Now listen, I'm doing the talking and I'm telling you this. Is it true that you've been putting this around that I've been carrying on with a fella? But you are, aren't you? Not that it's any of your business, but just for your information. That happens to be my husband. It is my silver wedding next year and I also have my marriage lines to prove it. More's the pity. <laughs> Oh. Well, you might say, oh. It's uh, just a bit of fun. A bit of fun? Tucked away at the back of your bowling bag. Oh, give up. Oh, I've heard about fellas of your age. They go off the rails. You want to watch it. Now, look, I've told you it was a bit of fun, that's I all. I can just see you going into the shop to buy it. All I hope is you had the decency to get it somewhere away from here, that's all. I didn't go in no shop. You got it on the market for all the world to see? No, somebody give it me. Oh, I'm not going telling tales and getting anybody into trouble. No. Oh. Well, when you next see her, give her my kind regards and tell her she's welcome to you. <laughs> Do you really think I look smashing? Well, I said sort of, no? Well, I feel smashing. <laughs> Don't you? I feel all right, that. Well, give us a kiss, then. Me? Hey? You would. Come on, you daft diaper. It is the second honeymoon, you know, not the first. Although, as I remember, you wasn't all that backward at coming forward then. What's that lipstick taste of? Woman stamp. <laughs> Woman. <laughs> oh. And back tonight on the street where they once lived are Doris Hare, Alan Rothwell, Jennifer Moss, Daphne Oxenford, Diana Davis, Ivan Beavis, Eileen Mayers, Doreen Keogh, Anne Reed, and Madge Hendel.
Uh, you were determined not to find yourself in a lock-in situation at the Rovers. You write a television series for Granada called The War of Darkie Pillbeam. Now, there's a familiar face under this wimple. Oh, but there must be some mistake. I'm, I'm low Anglican. I've come to cast out your devil. Sister Roy Barraclough would like a word. Do you remember? Do you remember us filming that sequence, Tony? You said that we looked like a couple of refugees from The Sound of Music. But Pillbeam, of course, wasn't the only one that I had to be grateful to you for, because in 1964, I made my first appearance in the street as a tour guide. I was just a jobbing actor at Old Rep at the time, but then indeed so many of us were. Have a lovely evening, Tony. I'm sorry I can't be with you, but uh, I've got to stay at home to wash the cat. <laughs> you know, I could smell it in the custard at tea time. <laughs> By the way, I think there's somebody else from Pilbeam you might recognise. Thank you, Roy. Well, as Roy said, there was someone else in Darkie Pilbeam who, unknown to her then, was Coronation Street bound. You wrote just one line for her in that film. Do you mean to say that a fella on his honeymoon has got to make do with just prunes? Oh, it's not us. First date down, got scrambled eggs. Prunes will last out while they last out, and God himself knows what latecomers will keep the strength upon. I'd sent Lad up to tip him off if I were you. A few million lines later, she's just moved on from the Rovers, but she's back tonight. Julie Goodyear. <laughs> Julie, you made your first appearance in Coronation Street in 1966. Yes, I did, yes. Go on, you talk. Are you going to let me? Yes, go on. A lot of people don't realise, Tony, by creating Coronation Street, didn't just give actors and actresses jobs. He gave so many people jobs. Floor managers, directors, other writers, producers, typists. They typed the scripts. And this is the man who did all of that. And when you think he was, what was it, Tony? I didn't get anything wrong after what I've heard back then. <laughs> Impossible. Twenty-three. Twenty-three. That is quite incredible. It really is. But on a very personal note, I have to say that Tony Warren is a friend. And good friends are there when the good times aren't. And that's my mate. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Julie. <laughs> now, the late 60s, you seek new inspiration. You abandoned the familiar warmth of the north of England for the roar of the California freeway. It was the decade of sex, drugs and rock and roll. By the time you returned to Granada in the 70s, it had taken its toll. Now, you've written very honestly about your addictive life at that time. Was it hard to get free of it? No, it was a miracle. It was a miracle. Uh, it was hard to stay free of it, but getting free of it was a miracle. But there was always a welcome for you on the mat in Coronation Street, and in 1985 you were invited to the Edinburgh Television Festival to celebrate the street's Silver Jubilee. There you met two people who would have some influence on your future career, Melvin Bragg and his wife, Kate Haste. <laughs> <laughs> Melvin, you introduced Kate to Tony. Yes, I knew this extraordinary man because I'd written about Coronation Street and he came out to the festival and he gave this brilliant performance to a tough audience without any notes, but afterwards I learned he'd been terrified. I learned that partly from my wife Kate who met him on the station the next day because she too was going back to Manchester. That's right, and we went onto the train, didn't we? we and we did. started talking. Yes, about love, life, death, God, war. And ourselves, ourselves, ourselves. You, we did. And we giggled an awful lot. <laughs> yes. A tremendous amount. And then you told me that you'd been, you'd been in a low point in your career and that you were wanting to write. You were wanting to write a provincial novel. And you said that you were a bit worried about doing it. And I could see from the conversation that you had a wonderful powers of observation. You gave me a terrible telling off. I did. I said, if, I, I said, if you don't write it, the next time I meet you, I won't actually speak to you again. <laughs> and I also said, just do it. Just do it. Write it. Write it. 
And you did. The result was The Lights of Manchester, which was uh, recommended as one of the books of the year by the Sunday Times. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Melvin. You. Thank you, Kate. <laughs> Thank you for coming. So, Tony, the 90s see you appointed an MBE and launched on a new career as a novelist. Your second book is called Foot of the Rainbow. And in it, you describe the riots we found ourselves in at Berkeley 25 years ago. You dedicated your book to her, and we've flown her from California tonight, your friend, Susan Suttle. <laughs> I've been ringing her for three days. Yes, she was on her way here all the time. So, Susan, that was obviously a very dramatic time. It was indeed. Tony, I thank you for your friendship. And I, I must tell you, he's a great researcher, and he came to Berkeley many times to research his second book, Foot of the Rainbow, which I must say, he's given me the greatest greatest present in the world to dedicate it to me. Thank you, Tony, for your friendship. Thank you, Susan. <laughs> well, 35 years since you created Coronation Street, here's just one of so many memorable scenes. Look at the mess! I told you that you only wanted sweeping! You don't need sweeping now! Look at me! Look at the mess! Look at my dinner! Never mind your dinner! Look at me memorial! <laughs> It's eight years since she moved out of number 13, but she is back for you tonight. Hilda Ogden herself, Jean Alexander. Well, Jean, the, the last word to you. Well, I've got the greatest admiration for this man who's overcome so many trials and tribulations. And I want to say a very big thank you to you, Tony, on behalf of us all, for giving so many of us the opportunity of having what is a secure job in this very insecure profession. Because it's only because of your expertise, imagination, creativity, otherwise none of us would be here tonight. But this isn't the end of the Tony Warren story, not by a long chalk because you're still writing, thank goodness. I've read your first two novels. I can't wait to read the next one. <laughs> thank you. Tony Warren, this is your life. <laughs>